This is Justin. And this is Haley. You're listening to The Price of Avocado Toast. We're a married millennial couple wanting to normalize the conversations around money. We want to hear about your highs and your lows. The do's and the don'ts on your path towards financial freedom. Toasties, welcome to the price of avocado toast. Whether you're a first time listener or you've been following us from the start of this thing, we're so glad to have this conversation with you today. Today, we are chatting with Lexa from the Avocado Toast budget. So, this is a legit avocado toast collaboration, and I am so freaking excited for you guys to hear what we have to share with you today. Yeah. I agree. Lexa is blowing up right now on TikTok. She creates this really easy to digest content that I think fits with the quick snapshots that millennials and younger folks want to um, consume right now on social media. So she's blowing up on TikTok. And it's kind of dope because she was like one of the first Instagram followers that we had. And we were like, oh, this is pretty funny. Like, this is cool. And now she's like taking off. And we couldn't be more thrilled for her. It's exciting to watch her growth, but it's also really selfishly exciting because we've built a good relationship with her to where we can have her on to chat um, and and to share more and to to hear more of some of her ideas about things. And and yeah, and like I said, consume her content. It's just awesome. She's basically famous, you guys. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, over social media, she's famous. And it's really cool to watch, um, watch her stuff just explode. But that being said, She is the avocado toast budget. So obviously she's focusing on budgeting for millennials, which is exactly what we vibe with since we are the price of avocado toast talking about normalizing money with millennial people, you know, normalizing these conversations. So we really hope you enjoy this chat with Lexa. Again, if you want to come onto our podcast, shoot us a message. We really want to hear from everyone. We want to hear everyone's highs and lows no matter what you're doing or how you're doing it. So hit us up. All right, guys, enjoy. What is going on, you guys? We are talking today with Lexa. She's from the Avocado Toast Budget. I feel like the world is working in synchronicity right now because us Toasties are talking to another Toasty. This is pretty rad. Thanks for uh, chatting with us this morning. Woohoo! I am so excited. The whole world of Avocado Toast is coming together. Yes. Look at us millennials go support the avocado toast business. Yes. <laughs> Loving it. So you, when did you start your Instagram? Because I feel like we started ours kind of around the same time. I think we did because I think you were actually one of the first people that I followed on my Instagram. I think it was back in August or September that I like really started it. It might have been this a little year? bit before that. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. You no, know, I think it was before that because we started in June. And then, yes, maybe you revamped then. But but I originally, when we first got on, I was like, hey, there's another avocado to- toast person and a budget person. This is legit. And she's not a podcast, so it doesn't, like, we didn't steal her name. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> yes, I was so, so t- excited. <laughs> Tells us that you focus on millennials. Yes, I do. Millennials are where it's at. So I actually, when I was like thinking about who my like who I wanted to target, I had to go Google if I was technically still a millennial because I guess <laughs> Same. we did that too. <laughs> yes. I guess I'm like on the cusp right there because I'm 24, so I was born in 94 or 96. So it's like right there. <laughs> But I feel like I, I jive with millennials more than anything. So. There you go. Just <laughs> lean into the millennial culture and you'd be like, adopt me, guys. I'm right on the edge. Take <laughs> yes. me. So tell everybody what Avocado Toast Budget is. Like, what, are, what, what is the account? What are your goals for it? What do you do? How do you describe it to people? What is it? Yeah. So the Avocado Toast Budget, I actually started it. The first thing ever was a blog um, because I wanted to start like documenting my journey with realizing how life-changing budgeting can be. But I also knew budgeting got a really bad rep sometimes. Um, A lot of people saw it as like this, when I told people I budget or I talked about budgeting, people like would like lean back and like 
scour a little bit, which I feel like that was my interpretation of budgeting too, before I got into this world. Um, I was not for it at all because I thought that budgeting needed to be something that was really restrictive and that meant that I was no longer gonna have fun. I was no longer gonna be able to spend money on the things that I liked and that it would just completely change my world negatively. Um, and then when I actually got into it and I started budgeting and I realized like, oh wow, <laughs> this is, it doesn't have to be that way. Like it can actually be so freeing. I, I wanted to share that with people. And I really just thought that I would like kind of type into the void, hoping that maybe like my people would find me eventually <laughs> and started posting on Instagram. And then one day I decided that I was going to do a TikTok, which I was really nervous about because up until then I had kind of kept the avocado toast budget anonymous. That's why I didn't use my name at first. I wasn't sure if I wanted to like put myself out there because I do have a day job. And I was like, I don't know if like how I'm going to feel about people in my real life knowing all about my financial history and everything that I've been through. Um, even though I felt good sharing that and I want to share my real numbers, I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to share my real numbers with people who knew me in the real world. Uh, but so when I decided, okay, I like TikTok, I can scroll for hours <laughs> on this platform, why not make a couple of videos? And that's kind of just uh, when things kind of started to blow up. And I, <laughs> I realized that there were a lot of people out there that were like me that didn't know anything about budgeting and felt really overwhelmed. And um, I wanted to be able to help out with that and, and share in those experiences. That's yeah. awesome. So obviously then you have like these helper traits, but do you find that you're also a relatively competitive person? Because I know for us, like once we finally started to budget, like there's times where I treat it almost like, a competition or a game or like where can we cut what can we do you know like what can we trade out to make it so we're staying within our budget and i know that she's like the master of that as well like she'll be like hey well we're significantly under right here so we can steal a couple dollars here move it over to here and we're good for example like we have months where we both got to get our hair cut and like this month we forgot to budget for my haircut so like oh shoot we got to pull some from somewhere else which means we got to <laughs> pull this line item down do you find that you're like that you have those competitive traits as well? I think that it's so interesting because I think that I am kind of competitive, but for some reason, when it comes to budgeting, I'm like, so go with the flow, <laughs> which like my budget itself is so structured, but like, I honestly, I still find myself and I tell people this all the time, overspending in categories all of the time. <laughs> And I find myself constantly still changing like what my goals are. And I feel like when I, I have a set goal, I am very like that competitive nature kind of comes out and I'm like, okay, I'm going to hit this. Like, what can I do to reach that? But the day to day spending aspects of my budget, I really am like, so I'm like, okay, if I overspend here, like what am, what am I going to take it from? Like, okay, I guess I chose this coffee over $5 from my vacation fund this time. Maybe I'll make a different decision next time. Um, and learn from it and go from there, you know? I love that. Um, you had said that you have a day job. Are you comfortable sharing kind of what you do? You don't have to say like where you work, but kind of what you do during the day when you're not on social media all the time. Yeah. Um, so I work in the healthcare field. I actually work with autistic children. Um, so I just in March, I graduated with my master's degree in psychology. So that was just kind of like the natural step. I, was so thankful because when everything was kind of shutting down during the pandemic, I just happened to kind of ease in, into there and I got just lucky after lucky after lucky um, to be able to get my dream day job. Um, and, but I was, uh, I was laid off there for a while for about six weeks during the pandemic. And that's kind of when I started deciding that I wanted to do a blog and kind of getting the ATB up and going. Cause I started to realize like I was researching about side hustles and about multiple streams of income and I wanted to be able to do that. Um, and that was not something that I had before and I really wasn't sure what my income was gonna look like at that point, which I was lucky enough to be able to get a steady income after that. Um, but yeah, that's what I do during the day. And then I, and then I come home and I'm on TikTok and Instagram and <laughs> hanging out. That sounds like what I try and totally fail to do <laughs> yeah. because I was so active on social media and then I got my job back because we're teachers. Both of us are teachers. We have the mm -hmm. summer off. I had all the time in the world and then come August, 
the my social media went down because I couldn't quite manage it. So how do you find the time to manage all of that with your job? So honestly, Google Calendar is like my best friend in the world. <laughs> if something is not on my Google Calendar, it's not happening in my life. I have forgotten about it. It is not in my head. It's not anywhere else. So I have found that's the biggest thing. I have to plan everything out in Google Calendar. And I'm also the kind of person, so when I was looking into like how to manage my time, because that was never uh, honestly my strong suit, um, I was looking into types of like time management skills. And I guess there's one where like you plan out like your days and you do only specific things on certain days that, that never worked for me because inevitably I would get home and I was I should be filming and I'm like, I don't want to film. <laughs> I don't want to be in front of the camera today or I don't want to be writing a blog post today. So instead I've, I've allotted times, but I've allowed myself to kind of go with my motivation, which seems to work pretty well for how my brain works. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I know it just takes a lot of time. A lot of people don't recognize that it's not just like putting together the content either. It's also like building a following. It's engaging and responding with uh, comments that people say because that's what people want. In social media, we want connection. We don't want, you know, followers to just be talking into some void that's like never going to answer back to them. You want to engage and it just it takes a lot of effort. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. Like they think like social media is just somebody sitting around and like trying to gain clout and it's like sure if I have a product or a service that I'm trying to promote or um, something that I'm really passionate about that I want to grow that is time where I'm going to be sitting around and scrolling through social media but there is actually a ton of work that people just don't really recognize or value so I yeah I, I props to you because I know that for us I was just like dang this is a lot of work to do it is so much work and I think people really like don't understand like you were saying how much connection goes into it because people are smart. Social media has been around for long enough that if you don't have a connection with your followers, if you're not your genuine self, people see right through that, you know, and it can be hard to find that balance too, between you want to be your genuine self, but you also need to have boundaries as well. Um, so it's just like a whole other world trying to make sure that you maintain those connections, but you're also true to yourself and true to the relationships that you have in, in your real life outside of social media. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I remember when you came out and you had your picture and you're like, hey, I am Lexa. This is the name. This is the face behind the account. Um, I I'm, remember you saying like, hey, like, the avocado toast is. budget, put her picture up. She's a human. <laughs> like not some, you know, bimoji person, you know, people, but so many people, especially in the debt free community on social media at all. Like you said, if you're talking about how much debt you have or your income or any of that, it can be super private or maybe you work somewhere where you make more money than your coworkers and you don't really want that to be super public knowledge or whatever it can be uncomfortable so props to you for just being transparent I feel like that really helps people you know like you said connect with you and want to follow you and want to they want more yes yes I definitely I understand where people are coming from not wanting to put that out there and like it being connected to them because I, I was there too. Um, and having a day job, like you guys are teachers, it, it's hard to like talk about your finances. And I actually just this past week was, I didn't tell my work about the avocado toast budget, but someone from my job found it. So it's now like <laughs> it's out there. <laughs> and I was nervous at first. Cause I was like, Oh, this has gotten real. It's not just like my family and my friends that already knew that I was in $20,000 of credit card debt and still have $70,000 in student loans. This is now like my coworkers and the people who you don't really talk about that kind of stuff with now know all of this information and it's, it can be scary. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, we're hyped on it. Cause obviously you know that us, like we, we're teachers, you can find our salaries online. You know, we try and be as transparent as possible and um, we want to normalize having those conversations. So I'm secretly glad that one of your coworkers <laughs> found it and yes. now you got more followers. So that's pretty rad. Yes. <laughs> um, so I want to continue on this like idea of transparency because I was scrolling through your Instagram today. And, um, like I was saying, I, 
I try my best to not curse on the podcast, but I I curse like a sailor in our home. <laughs> like it's really bad. Um, and it's I mean I I'm very skilled at like shutting it off. I'm sure my grandma is listening to this right now. <laughs> uh, Granny Winnie, I love you. I'm sorry that I have a potty mouth sometimes, <laughs> um, but I do a really good job of turning it off around her. Um, but I I I actually really appreciate that. Like in I watched a video that we'll bring up later, but like it's very, it's like f this, f that, f this, f that, and I'm like, oh, like this is what people need to hear. Like we have this idea that like money is taboo, and then you combine it with taboo language, and so then you're really stripping down these walls of transparency. You're really getting down to people being able to sit and talk about stuff, whether they have a clue about money or don't, whether they have a clue about their own financial situation or don't, and whether they curse or not. Like you're really like pulling back these taboo ideas. Um, so I'm, I'm really appreciative of that transparency. I think that a lot of times we put on this like shine of like who we are. Like I'm this blogger, like look at me. Here's my avocado toast picture, right? Like versus being like, no, like I've got debt. This sucks. Fuck this. <laughs> like, you know, like it, yeah, I like that. Oh, so I appreciate sure. the transparency. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, I, I actually thought about this for a while when I was starting my page of like whether I wanted to talk like I do in real life because in real life, the F word is like my favorite word. <laughs> I use it <laughs> so often. <laughs> and I was like, you know, but I also want my content to be accessible to people and I don't want people to like be worried about what whatever, like reading my content around <clears throat> others or listening to my content around their kids. But then I was like, you know, I've set out to be, like you said, this word transparent, like as real and here I am and here's all this stuff that, that I've had to deal with and that I have a feeling you're dealing with similar things. So like, let's actually talk about it. And I figured I couldn't do that without being like my true self in all those other ways. Um, same thing with like being very open about the fact that I'm in a relationship with a woman and that, I mean, I am a woman and women in finances that still has this like negative connotation to it. And I still get comments about it as well. And, you know, but it, it's about being real and letting other people who are like me know that I've been there. I'm go going through the same things, but it's possible to come out on the other side. That's awesome. I love that. And so many people relate to that. They feel the same way. This, this sucks. No one wants to be sitting drowning in student loans and waiting and waiting and waiting for someone to just pay for it <laughs> but we're all kind of just sitting there justin keeps thinking like so if uh president-elect biden like pays off the loans wh what are we gonna do mm -hmm. <laughs> like i don't know if we can rely on that but you know we're, we're all just sitting there wondering and hoping that we can get through this big mountain of debt that we have so you said that you have right now um credit card debt and student loans right do you have anything else so i paid off my credit card debt um oh, so the awesome. only thing that I, I i know such a big thing um that was incredible i paid off my credit card debt i have sixty eight thousand dollars in student loans but i always just round it up to 70 because i'm sure once that interest uh, starts coming back it'll get there pretty quickly uh but it is a mountain seventy thousand dollars worth of any debt is really overwhelming and i know other people who have so much more than that um and people who don't have quite as much but either way it just feels like this thing that is always going to be there yeah it's a lot of money for sure we we definitely we were in the six figure uh student loan debt so we can appreciate that it's a lot of money for sure and it, it does feel like a mountain looking up at it sometimes and i remember before we had talked about like paying it off feeling like i'm just gonna die with these student loans like there's no way i'll ever get ahead in california enough to pay off these it's just insane <laughs> we both went through a teaching master's program combined thing and we started our careers making between 55 and 60,000 a year, like our base pay. And in California, that's a decent amount of money for starting. Um, but the only, we only make 1,200. Do you make 1,000? No, I make 1,200. Okay, we only make 1,200 a year for having a master. So <laughs> we both got $50,000 master degrees and we will never pay that off based off of the little stipend that we get. So it's just, <laughs> it's a joke. Oh my gosh. Only $1,200 a year. 
Yeah. Extra like, hundred bucks. It's <laughs> for tax just months. takes it right away. Like sick. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. So that we can definitely is. appreciate the cost for a master's degree in psych as well. Yes. I am so lucky that I was I was one of those people that when I got my master's degree and I got into a job with that, I was able to double my income. But even that, even doubling my income, it's not like I was making very much before. I think I was making like $28,000 um, and now I make 65. But even that doesn't begin to start to cover it when you're taking out taxes and you're taking out all these other things and suddenly I'm investing and I definitely wasn't investing back when, before. Like I thought that that was such a waste of money. And I thought that I would feel like I was rolling in this cash. And now I'm like, oh, <laughs> my student loans are due. And most of this money yeah. is going towards investing. And it's it's so interesting that uh, even though more money might be coming in, it doesn't always feel like that when you start having to tackle that debt and all of these other things that, that life throws at you. Yeah, it's so funny when you think about it too. Like back when I was a kid, if somebody was like, "Hey, you're gonna make sixty thousand dollars a year," I'd be like, "Sick, yeah, I am." Yes. And then you're like, "Oh, by the way, you have a mortgage and electricity and water and a baby and student loans and you gotta feed everyone." <laughs> and you're like, "Wait, please let me keep my money." It's just insane. Yeah. Insane. Like when we did our taxes this this past year. We made like almost one hundred and twenty thousand dollars combined, and I'm like, "That's a lot of money!" Like, "Holy shit, we're rich!" Like, uh, no, not where we live. That's nothing. That's like yeah. the poverty line in Sonoma County, and our mortgage <laughs> is one of our paychecks. It's yeah. literally fifty percent of our income. So, yeah. I mean, barely scraping by. We totally understand how that feels. <laughs> Yeah. And I feel like so many people are in that, that same boat, you know, like even yeah. we were actually the same thing. It hit us this year that we make over a hundred thousand dollars combined. And Liz was like, where does that money go? I'm like, it's so Stop. true. <laughs> I have a budget. I know where the money goes, but I still don't know where the money goes. <laughs> it Seriously. still just feels yeah. like it's disappearing. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So I want to kind of go back on your TikTok and chat about that because I swear to God, overnight it just happened. And uh -huh. I don't know if it felt like that to you, but for me, one day you didn't have a TikTok and the next day you had like a hundred thousand followers. <laughs> so we are talking to a TikTok star. I mean, you are. <laughs> don't you have like a million views on one of your videos? Aren't you famous? I, I, the, the most views I've gotten on a video is 1.5, I think, the last time I oh. checked, which is just, like, so weird. So weird to think about. <laughs> so what what was the happen? video? What was the video got, that got the most views? Uh, the one that got the most views was talking about zero-based budgeting and, like, doing a, a video on writing it down, like an example. Uh, I oh, actually cool. think it got a lot of views because people were mad about the price that I said I pay for rent. <laughs> but... <laughs> I was like, the principles are still here. Like, let's roll back and, and focus on how to budget, not the numbers. What did you say for rent? Eight fifty, which I know is so cheap, but it's what we pay. Yeah, eight fifty. Like, that's not that cheap for rent. It is yeah. what it is. I mean, there's places across the the nation that somebody's paying like three hundred bucks. Yeah. For you know, like splitting a room with two college buddies. Yeah. And they're hemmed up about eight fifty. Wait, where where are you? Where are you from? I feel like I am spacing out on this. Metro Detroit. Oh, Detroit. Okay. Oh, cool. I'm like you're on the East Coast somewhere, but I can't. Okay. Oh. Thank you, Michigan. Yes. We love you. <laughs> we love you, Michigan. <laughs> okay, so interesting. Yeah. All of a sudden, you're just famous. How does that feel? Do you get recognized in the grocery store yet? <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. That's no. a zero base budget girl. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, no. <laughs> um, but it, it feel, it's so weird. I was, I, I was talking to my coworkers about this and I was also chatting with my therapist about this because it's, <laughs> it's so interesting to go from what I thought was going to be. I thought I would, it would take years. And then I started my, yeah. So I started TikTok in the end of September, um, two weeks later, I qualified for the TikTok Creator Fund, which is you have to have 10,000 followers, which I just thought was like nuts. I was like, okay, this is like where I cap. This is, <laughs> I have peaked <laughs> TikTok. Um, but I was so excited to be making like cents a day <laughs> on like the videos that I was making. And then within the next month, it just like blew up <laughs> and it still doesn't quite feel real. I'm so thankful. 
Um, and I feel like I'm just overwhelmed by like the amount of impact I'm able to have. Um, and I, I try to stay humble about that and keep that in mind whenever I'm creating content. But it's also just awesome to be able to connect with so many people. And TikTok is, I love the algorithm. I love how it's been able to connect me with people. I mean, I have people from Australia and Iran and all of these other countries that I couldn't even imagine being able to, to talk with before. Um, it's incredible. That's pretty rad. Yeah. And your videos are so simple. Like it's to the point. Yeah. This is it. You give great money, um, money advice and hacks and all of that stuff, suggestions. But it's simple, and I just love the simplicity of it. It's not some really crazy done up thing. It's just mm -hmm. this normal person, which we are having this conversation with, talking about real life money skills. And I just, I really like the simplicity of it. And it's personally. concise. People yeah. need concise information. We're in a world now where everybody wants things broken down to just the bare bones of what they need to take away. And it For forces, sure. TikTok forces people to be concise with literally everything to the second and to the single word that's in a, a particular part. It's pretty interesting, actually. It's actually really interesting. Social media as a whole is um, incredible how you can use it. It's pretty cool. It really is. I, because when I was making, when I was making the avocado toast budget and I started off with blogging, like I said, and I really started to think about it. And I was like, how do I consume content? I don't sit there and read blogs. I, I think blogs are awesome, but for me, that's not how I consume content. And I don't feel like it's how the majority of people consume content anymore. I listen to podcasts. I watch YouTube videos while I'm cooking in the kitchen. I watch TikToks when I'm scrolling, like at bed at night. And I was like, this is what I, this is my life. So this is what I need to be doing on the internet as well. This is how I find my people because that was my whole thing is how do I find these people who I can actually connect with. And then everyone else, if you don't relate to my content, that's totally okay. Like you're, you'll find your place on the internet. There are tons of, of other people out there that have so opposite views for me. And that might be where you need to be, but I wanted to be able to create a deeper connection rather than just a connection with as many people as possible. Um, and, and I really love, like you were saying, that idea of being concise, getting to the point. Obviously, that's why I keep a YouTube channel as well, because I do think that there's more nuance to be had. And that's why I love podcasts. I love being able to listen to people talk and talk through that nuance. But there's also just some benefits of getting quick information fast um, to people who might not have accessed that information any other way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so many people that do that mindless scrolling too, mm -hmm. that it just, at some <laughs> point your video is going to pop up and you know, it might be that person that's like, Oh, actually I, I needed to hear this today, or this is something I connect with. I'm going to follow them or whatever. It, it, it's really cool actually how it works. And I, I like the new um, Instagram thing with the reels. So you can kind of sync both of them. Cause on the price of avocado toast, Instagram, when I'm on that, your reels will pop up. You know, oh, we so have so many things we have so many things in common, probably based off of just our names, <laughs> yeah. but, but our fault, we have followed so many of the same people. We have so many of the same followers. So it's funny because you pop up on mine a lot. So you're probably popping up on a lot of people's. That's how uh, my, my job found out about me, which was crazy to me. <laughs> That's I was wild. like, okay, TikTok's going to give me away. I seem to like TikTok and I are one. I know how to work that system. But Instagram is still kind of like an anomaly to me. I still don't know what I'm doing on that platform. So I was like, oh, no one will ever find my Instagram. And they did. <laughs> I was like, oh, I better <laughs> step awesome. up my game on here. <laughs> they got you. So I, I have to ask you about Dave Ramsey. So we follow Dave Ramsey. And I was talking to Justin this morning. And I'm like, okay. Hey, we want to talk to people about money and we want to talk to people who do things differently than us because we do it one way and there are so many different ways to do it. There's not one way to do anything and especially budgeting. We live in California. We sure as hell know $1,000 for an emergency fund is definitely not enough, but we still follow his plan and I know that you just can't stand Dave Ramsey. So I just would love well, to hear. Like I said, that video, that video was literally like, Dave Ramsey, fucking bullshit, fucking bullshit, <laughs> fucking bullshit. And I was like, that's every baby step. <laughs> it was pretty funny.
Yeah, so uh, Dave Ramsey and I are not one. <laughs> and I know, I, I know how impactful he is. My best friend, she just paid off all of her debt using his baby steps. Like I know he works. And if he works for you, that's awesome. Like I always tell people that if, if that is the plan that gets you excited about budgeting and gets you to want to stick to it and gets you to your goals, do it. But it did not work for me. <laughs> I started off with Dave Ramsey. He was like actually the first person in the personal finance space that I ever knew about. I had a, a personal finance course in high school that was literally nothing but just us watching hours of Dave Ramsey. <laughs> and then <laughs> years later, after I forgot all that information, uh, because it was high school and I always thought that it, it was not necessary, I later found him um, when I was just like scrolling through, kind of starting to get into budgeting, wanting to, to learn more. And I was like, oh, I remember this guy. Like, he's the budgeting guy. Like, he's the person that everyone talks about. And the more I looked into it, the more I was like, you know, uh, there are just so many things that personally I disagree with and that this just isn't going to work for me. And then I, I actually, I started talking about that and I realized how like upset it made people. And I didn't understand it because I was like, <laughs> dude, if it, like, I, I don't think he's out here paying you to like defend him. So I don't know why this is this is such a big deal. If it works for you, that's cool. I didn't tell you to to stop doing it. Um, I think that that's awesome. But I also know there are a ton of people out there that feel really bad based on the advice that he gives and feel like they can't budget based on this like we're, like more restrictive, more like very to the point budgeting that doesn't uh, strictly speaking allow a lot of room um, to adapt if you're like going with the baby steps as they are written, obviously you, there, you can adapt to anything. You can adapt to my advice, your guys' advice, Dave Ramsey's advice, of course. Um, but I, I've also heard a lot of feedback from people that felt very similar to me, that they felt like they couldn't budget because they couldn't do it how he recommended you do it. And I wanted to be able to be another voice that said, hey, even if this doesn't work for you, this is not the only way. Just because it's often the most popular way doesn't mean that it has to be the only way to do something. Yeah, for sure. There's there's things too like that we've, you know, not I don't want to say not followed kind of, but yeah, like there are when, many things that we have done our yeah, own way. When we were getting out of credit card debt, we took money out of our IRA because we we pulled out the contributions and paid off the credit cards immediately. But that was also because our habit of using the credit cards, like we were insane with using them. So it was like, okay, we're gonna he and he would never say to pull out your retirement, but we did it. Um, I mean, again, we're in California, a 15 year fixed on 25% of our income as teachers is not realistic. It's just not. Um, and so I know he, you know, he'll say like the math still holds up in California. They still do math over there. It's like, yeah, they do. And the math doesn't work for us. Yeah. Like we, we're not going to, I mean, at least not until we're year 15 of teaching. I mean, I just had a union meeting talking about our salary scale and it's, it's literally till like year 15 mm -hmm. till we're going to be able to afford a 15 year on a 25 percent of our income it just doesn't work like that so we have to go to the 30 year and maybe a higher interest rate and stuff so there's a lot of things i think that don't work and yeah the thousand dollars like we've cut it down to having a thousand dollars and i thought Haley was gonna have a panic attack because it is intense you know and slowly we've built it up to where we're like okay actually we have some other things we need to save for and so we have this pseudo cushion over a thousand dollars if something were to hit the fan because it's intense for sure but I do also have to add that if we're being completely transparent, we paid off all of our credit cards, mm -hmm. but we have not closed them mm -hmm. because, and I think that, well, we want to move. We want to buy a house. We, we have all these things that we really can't screw up our credit score. Another Dave Ramsey thing. He's like, credit scores don't matter. It does strongly mm -hmm. matter in California. And we, we just cannot afford to have our credit ruined that way. So we have not closed them. And so we've had to have the conversation so many times about what do we do when we have an emergency that is over $1,000? We would have to tap into one of the credit cards that we still have. They're just not – we're not using them. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, we've been credit card debt-free now almost a year. New Year's Day was the day that we paid it all off. Yay. Um, Woo. And we haven't had to pay anything on the card. So that's kind of a relief because I, mm -hmm. I, I thought there's no way $1,000 will last us, especially through anything. But we, we have had bumps this year, and we were able to pay it. But, but I understand that that's definitely not the case for, 
for everyone. Like, imagine if you have multiple kids or a bunch of sick animals, yeah. you know, Pand- or a pandemic and you lose your job. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. There are so many variables. Oh, there that's are. Crazy. And I actually, that's so funny because I actually just posted my um, latest YouTube video is talking about emergency funds. And I talk about how, like, I don't give people specific numbers even when people ask because like you said, it is so variable. Me, like me and my partner who have no kids, we live in a one bedroom apartment. We both have stable incomes. We're both essential employees. We probably don't need as much in an emergency fund as a single parent who has multiple people who are financially dependent on and who is low income or, you know, all of these variables add up to how much you need as a cushion there. And that's why I never, I never feel comfortable giving people how much they need in an emergency fund or how much they should be paying off in debt or how much they should be saving because who knows <laughs> until I'm in your shoes and I know everything about your life and your finances, there's no way for me to be able to, to tell you an exact number. Yeah. The one, I think that my biggest um, thing that I struggle with sometimes with Dave Ramsey is the car idea in that, I agree, you know, like, I'll never buy a new car again. It's appreciating value. Like, I'll just get a used car. But sometimes he'll recommend, like, just buy a $1,000 car, and it'll get you from A to B. And while I agree with that, like, yeah, sure, it'll get me from A to B. If you're somebody who doesn't know a lot about cars, you can end up sinking a lot of money into a $1,000 car because you don't have another option in your mind. Um, For example, like, when we, you know, we sold our car and we went to buy Haley another car, we got it for 8000 bucks. We could have easily found a car for 2000, 3000, uh, you know, 4000 that would have been fine. But at $8000, we found a car that was going to work much better for us and we sacrificed that extra few thousand dollars on the student loans. But it was because I didn't want to sink more money into a car that's going to break down on the side of the road for this that or the other thing. Um And so I really think that's the other point, you know, like he'll say like, you know, you're a single mom, you get you a thousand dollar car, get you from A to B. If I'm a single parent and that thousand dollar car breaks down, who's coming to save me? Who's coming to pick me, me and my kids up? Who's doing, doing this and that to make sure that we're good and have a ride to work? Because then if I don't have a ride to work, I got to take the bus. And then my kids are, you know, there's so many variables. And that's the one for me. I'm like, oh no, like I, I obviously I don't want to tell I'm not going to ever tell somebody to lease a car. I think leasing is foolish. I'm not going to tell somebody to go buy a new car. But, you know, if you don't have a good mechanic in your corner and any type of upfront money, it can be really hard to make the car stuff work. Um, And it's a necessity nowadays, obviously. Oh, for sure. That's the one that's hard for me, for sure. Yeah, I uh, and that's something I always try to keep in mind. And I talk about as well is that this idea of a it's looking at the whole price of something. And I don't think that the price needs to be just monetary price. But like you were saying, like the price of a thousand dollar car might not only be a thousand dollars. It might be, you have to break down. And if you or like, you might break down. And if you don't know how to, to tackle that, or you don't have anyone around you who can help tow or help you figure out what mechanic to go to, suddenly you're paying a lot more and maybe you lost out on a day's job. And also just this idea that not everything in the personal finance space is about money. Even even emergency funds, even debt. You're a human being with a life, a life outside of money, but that obviously money helps you to build. So you have to think about those things that are non-monetary as well. Absolutely. That was a big one for us was just creating the right habits and cleaning up some of the habits that were not even reflective of money. Yeah. It was, you know, money was what was like kind of like the vehicle that was showing us those issues. But there are, you know, things in the way that we spent from our childhood and, you know, some of the values that we had in our household that were more habit based than money based for sure. Yeah, the habits were were very toxic before we got a hold of them mm-hmm. <laughs> and changed them. So I, the entire reason I wanted to bring up this whole Dave Ramsey thing is I can't tell you how many times we've had people from Instagram and really just my friends and family reach out in some way or another and say, you know, I can't stand Dave Ramsey. I truly hate him. I don't like anything he says, but I love your podcast and I love what you're doing. And it's it's validating knowing that we can do something so differently than other people and still put 
what we're doing out there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we give advice. Sometimes we just talk. Sometimes we talk to different people. But there's no one way to do it. There's no one way to budget. And just because we are doing it this way does not mean that Joe from Missouri doing it another way is wrong. You know, we're all going to get there one way or another. And I just really appreciate your honesty with it because so many people do do not like Dave Ramsey or what he is doing or his attitude sometimes. And he's not the only way. Definitely not. Yeah, who knows? Maybe maybe in a couple years we'll be we'll be listening to like the Avocado Toast budget. Yes. You know, show and it'll be like a YouTube three hour long thing that yes. like plays in the background while Calliope's doing something. Yes. <laughs> Speaking would, into existence. Yes. <laughs> I love that idea. I love that you guys have found core advice that works for you, but you've also adapted it. And I think that that's what this is all about is going with the flow. If something doesn't work for you, trying something else, just because one type of budgeting you didn't click with doesn't mean that, that you suck at it or doesn't mean that it's not for you. It's all about making it match your life and your lifestyle and the kind of person that you are. For sure. And that's, that's part of normalizing it too, is like saying like, Hey, there's not one right way to do thing. You know, as long as you're being conscientious and even thinking of it, then that's a great start. For sure. So Alexa, what are your goals for moving forward with the avocado toast budget? What do you, where do you see yourself going? Cause I'm sure you didn't see it blowing up as big as it is right now. Yeah, uh, I definitely didn't. It's so interesting now that uh, 2021 is coming around. I kind of had to start sitting down and thinking about that. Cause I was like, Oh, this is like, getting real. Like, uh, not too long ago, I actually, I started my like new day job at around the same time I started the avocado toast budget thinking that like maybe in five years, I was telling Liz, like I would make enough for, for us to have like an extra thousand dollars a month to be able to put toward debt or put toward whatever we wanted to. And now I'm like, this could be, uh, like this could be my full-time job. And like, what do I want to do with it? Um, and I've been kind of just uh, going back and forth with ideas. I really love more than anything, the social media aspect of it. I've always been someone who, who gravitated more toward that than like courses or books or anything. And may, you know, maybe that'll change in the future. But for now, my biggest goal is to be able to provide as much content as I can that is free to the masses, but that is still hopefully sustainable in some way that I can make a full-time income off of it at some point. Um, but that still stays true to, to, you know, who I am and, and to what I feel like is the most helpful for the people who are listening as well. That'd be so cool. I uh, I'm that, rooting yeah. for you. Yeah, seriously. And like you said earlier, like there's not a lot of um, women in the finance space. There's not a lot of queer women in the finance space. So the fact that you're able to um, be out there and to, to have that, grow so quickly is encouraging for a lot of human beings because that's where our world is at that's where it's going we have a lot of really archaic type of people that are the front of finance Dave and Ramsey. it needs to change <laughs> um, it just it needs to change so and especially like us we have two you know we have calliope one daughter we have a second one on the mm -hmm. way like as a dad two girls like i i want them to see they can do anything recently there was a, a female uh, kicker for a uh, power five school in in college there's been women that are totally changing the landscape for coaching in the nfl and as a football coach myself if my daughter ends up coaching in the nfl or playing in the nfl for whatever reason um i mean i it, it would blow my mind that that's where our world's going but to to for that to happen they have to see things where women are succeeding they have to see mm -hmm. those moments um, even, even as simple as like a TikTok financer, like that's, it's just cool. Yeah. It's just so dope to me. Makes me excited. You're doing it. Woo, woo. Yeah. It's so awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, go ahead and plug whatever you want to plug all of your cool stuff, because we're hoping that the, the like 117 people or who's ever out there listening to this right now, <laughs> come and follow you on TikTok. Yeah. So go ahead and plug your stuff. Yeah. Um, so you can find me at the Avocado Toast Budget on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. Those are the three places that I am the most often. And we will put all of those links in our show notes as well so people can just go there, click the link, and then find you. And I followed you recently on YouTube because we actually 
put our podcast on YouTube, but it's just a little avocado picture in the audio. Yeah. Um, just because it auto syncs the um, closed captioning. And I figured maybe, who knows, maybe some deaf people want to listen to our podcast. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> but nobody listens. <laughs> We have no subscribers. But that's okay. As long as you're providing yeah. equal access. It is okay. And then I and then you popped up because I I don't know, I typed in something about avocado toast and you popped up and I'm oh, like, hey, yay. I know her. <laughs> that's dope. I love it. Well, Lexa, thank you so much for sitting down with us. We appreciate you taking some time on a Sunday morning to chat with us. Um, it, it's been awesome to to hear about your explosion in TikTok fame and also for you to just kind of change the the landscape of social media financing and uh, and all the money talks around that. So we appreciate you joining us this morning. Yes, thank you so much. I, I love talking to you guys. Thank you for having me on. Definitely. You are the best. Yeah, take care. All right, Toasties, thank you so much for tuning in this week. And if you've made it this far through this episode, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for coming back this week. We took a break last week while Justin did his play, and we're just really happy to be back in action and get the ball rolling while we go into 2021. And if you guys missed my show, which is totally okay, I'm not that heartbroken about it, you are able to actually live stream it on the 24th and the 25th. Well, I shouldn't say live stream it. You're able to stream it after it's been recorded on the 24th and the 25th. So check our story for links to that if you want to watch It's a Wonderful Life with your family on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. So, yeah, support local theater. Woo! Anyways, that's going to do it for this episode of The Price of Avocado Toast. As always, we are so thankful that you guys stuck around to have this conversation, and we're so thankful to be a part of this community. As always, happy budgeting. You've got this, Toasties. Thank you for listening to The Price of Avocado Toast. If you vibed with this episode, share it with a friend. We'd love to continue building our listening community. If you're interested in speaking more with a financial coach, hit up our coach Ryan at Me Financially Free on Instagram. Use the promo code HELP50 in the consultation notes section to receive 50% off. 